welcome back and this is chapter 54 this is the um, earthing arrangement protective conductor part of part five in this uh, in this um chapter we're going to look at sizing of earthing sizing of bonding selection of electrodes selection of earthing selection of bonding um and we'll cover the adiabatic equation towards the end so chapter 54 We've got general, every means of earthing and every protective conductor shall be selected and erected so as to satisfy the requirements of the regulations. The earthing system of an installation may be subdivided, in which case each part thus divided shall comply with the requirements of this chapter. And if there's a lightning protection system, then we'll refer to the standards for lightning protection systems. Earthing arrangements. The earthing arrangements may be used jointly or separately for protective and functional purposes according to the requirements of the installation. The main earthing terminal shall be connected with earth by one of the methods described in Regulations 421, sorry, uh, 542.1.2.1 to 542.1.2.3. As appropriate type of system for which the installation is to form part of and in compliance with Regulations 542.1.3.1 and 542.3. 542.1.3.2. So 542.1.2, the supply arrangements. This is um, a little bit of text which just describes these, really. So for a TNS system, the means shall be provided for the main earthing terminal of the installation to be connected to the earth point at the source of energy. Part of the connection may be formed by the distributor's lines and equipment. So there's your TNS there. For a TNCS system where protective multiple earthing is provided, means shall be provided for the main earthing terminal of the installation to be connected by the distributor to the neutral of the source of energy. And that's in there. For a TTRIT system, the main earthing terminal shall be connected via an earthing conductor to an earth electrode complying with 542.2. Okay, installation earthing arrangements. The earthing arrangements shall be such that the values of impedance from the consumer's main earthing terminal to the earth point of the supply for a TN system or to earth for a TT and IT system is in accordance with the protective and functional requirements of the installation and considered to be continuously effective. And earth faults and protective conductor currents which may occur are carried without danger particularly from thermal thermomechanical and electromechanical stresses we'll cover that towards the end of this one and they're adequately robust or have additional mechanical protection appropriate to the assessed conditions of external influence um there'll be a little mention on that in a minute on the next page on table 54.1 but we'll also look at with like sizing of Protective conductors and bonding conductors will be saying if the cables run um, unsheathed without mechanical protection. So, so just like a, a, a like a, a single green yellow cable that's just clipped to run along, um, then we'll have to size it um, to a level for uh, consideration of mechanical strength. Okay. Um... 542.1.3.3 Where a number of installations have separate earthing arrangements, any protective conductors common to any of these installations shall either be capable of carrying the maximum fault current light to flow through them or be earthed within one installation only and insulated from the earthing arrangements of any other installation. In the latter circumstance, if the protective conductor forms part of a cable, the protective conductor shall be earthed only in the installation containing the associated protective device. So if we have a number of buildings and they have separate sources of supply, maybe this building has its own TNS and this building has its own TT system because it's an outbuilding, we are, we either would have them com you know, uh, with common electrical um, systems and they'll be sized to the larger fault current, so it would be the TNS fault current respectively because the TT would be a, a, lower, uh, a lower current due to the higher impedance. Or um, we actually insulate them from each other but we do make sure that the cable going from one to the other that the protective conductor shall be earthed only in the insulation containing the associated protective device so the consumer the um the the supply end basically 
542.2 Earth Electrodes. A good example of that scenario we just mentioned actually, we'll be covering caravan parts later on. Electrodes. The design used for and construction of an earth electrode should be such as to withstand damage and take account of possible increase in resistance due to corrosion. Suitable earth electrodes shall be used. The following types of earth electrodes are recognised for the purpose of the regulations. So we have earth rods or pipes, tapes and wires, plates, underground structural metalwork, etc. Okay. Um... It, de it depends on the circumstance, on the um, you know the the soil's resistivity and the you know even the conductivity of the soil as to what is the best type of electrode to use. Really, five four two dot two dot three, where foundation earth electrodes are installed. This was one of the things they were going to try and introduce for all new builds, but they kind of lent back. But it will probably come in in amendment one or two more regularly. But when they are installed, the materials and dimensions of the earth electrodes shall be selected to withstand corrosion and to have adequate mechanical strength. Right. The type and embedded depth of an earth electrode shall be such that the soil drying and freezing will not increase its resistance above the required value. With regards to earth electrode testing, it's always a good idea to have them... Um, you know, if, if you're going to do an earth electro resistance um, test when you install it, let's say now this time of year, you know, it's, um, it's you know, we, we, we're in a fairly dry spell, it's summertime, but if you were to install an electrode, you'd want to test it again in the, in the, the polar opposite of the, of the, uh, of the wind, of the, uh, the weather conditions really, so dry, wet frozen conditions um, if you do like regular routine per uh, periodic inspections of an installation with an earth electrode if you were to say oh, I'll come back in five years or 12 months or whatever change it to a month less or a month more so that as you do some tests that it kind of staggers around the year or if you can move it six months you know bring it six months prior um, so that you know you can test the different seasons with the electrode resistance The use as an earth electrode of the lead sheath or other metallic uh, covering of a cable shall be subject to all the following. So adequate precautions will be taken to prevent excessive deterioration by corrosion. The sheath or covering shall be in effective contact with earth. The consent of the owner of the cable shall be obtained, because if they take it away, that's no good, is it? An arrangement shall exist for the owner of the electrical installation to be warned of any proposed change to the cable which might affect its suitability as an earth electrode. This next one, they used to have a lot of questions come out of because of the wording. 542.2.6 A metallic pipe for gases or flammable liquids shall not be used as an earth electrode. The metallic pipe of a water utility supply pipe shall not be used as an earth electrode. Other metallic water supply pipe works shall not be used as an earth electrode unless precautions are taken against its removal and it has been considered for such a use. So they used to throw this around saying, oh, you know, a water utility supply pipe can be used as an earth electrode and the answer would be uh, in no condition. Followed by a question, when can a water supply pipe be used as an earth electrode? The answer being when precautions are taken against its removal. The key thing is, is the water pipe a utility pipe? Here's a little illustration of this. So here we have an industry with another building. There's mains power. We've got a sub main here. And we have our extraneous conductive parts coming into the building. And this is obviously the utility supply pipe, which cannot be used as an earth electrode. And so a separate earth electrode would have to be used. We cannot use the water utility supply pipe. Because if we used it, they could take it away, they could replace part of it, and so its value is obviously uh, not controllable. But then the extraneous conductive part comes into the building, but then it goes off and becomes an extraneous conductive part again, because it goes back underground. So this is something that I mentioned this all back in I think chapter forty-one when I talked about uh, like you know kitchens and things with 
cables going underneath. Um, if you put a pipe underground, it becomes extremely conductive part again. But this obviously, let's say this is the water pipe, this is the stop clock, and then here is a bit of a main feed from it to the outbuilding. This is an extremely conductive part, but this is under your control, this part of pipework. And if this is under your control, you can utilize it as an earth electrode, as illustrated here. Right. So can a water can a water pipe be used as an earth electrode? The answer is, is if precautions are taken against its removal. Can a water utility supply pipe be used as an electrode? The answer is no. Okay, we then have earthen conductors, 542.3. Every earthen conductor should comply with section 543 and where PME conditions apply, such as the TNCS system. We meet the requirements of Regulation 544.1.1 for the cross-sectional area of the main protective bonding conductor. In addition, when buried in the ground, that's that buried in the ground is what we're looking for here. The earthy conductor shall have a cross-sectional area not less than that stated in Table 54.1. For a tape or strip conductor, the thickness shall be such as to withstand the mechanical damage and corrosion. So we're not talking here about the effectiveness of the earth in conductor for an earth. We're talking about the consideration that taking a earth in conductor and burying it in the ground, it may require sizing to accommodate protection against uh, mechanical uh, damage and protection against corrosion. And that is given in this table. So we have protection against corrosion by sheath or not protected against corrosion down the left. And we have along the top protection by uh, against mechanical damage or not protected against mechanical damage. So you can see if we had a copper cable, we could be as small as two five if we had both protective measures. Um, if we had neither, twenty five mil. So quite common. You may get a question along this line of a buried earthing conductor. If the clue is saying the clue is if it's saying buried earthing conductor come straight here All right the connection of an earthing conductor to an earth electrode or other means of earthing shall be soundly made and it will be electrically and mechanically satisfactory and labeled in accordance with regulation 514.13.11 which was the safety electrical connection do not remove tag it shall be suitably protected against corrosion Main earthing terminals or bars. In every installation, a main earthing terminal shall be provided to connect the following to the earthing conductor. So we have the CPCs, the circuit protective conductors, which will go to the expo you know the um, exposed conductive parts of all of the electrical equipment. The protective bonding conductors. So we have obviously here main protective bonding conductors. What's not illustrated here is the supplementary, but we'll see a little example of that in a second. Functional earthing conductors, and let's remember that functional earthing conductors do not achieve protection, so they cannot be coloured green and yellow, instead they are coloured green. And lightning protection if applicable. To facilitate measurement of the resistance of the earthing arrangement, means shall be provided in an accessible position for disconnecting the earthing conductor. Such means may conveniently be combined with the main earthing terminal or bar. Any joint shall be capable of disconnection only by means of a tool. So in, in your domestics or small installations, you can just get the screwdriver, undo the main earthing terminal and take that out. That's fine. But when you go to the larger installations, switch rooms, for example, you'll often notice when you've got all the switch gear in front of you, maybe behind you on the wall or further down in the corner, there'll be a big brass earth bar. And there'll be all these large earths and bonds, but then there'll be a, a link, like a bolted link, which then goes to the main earthing conductor. And the idea being, you know, you just get a simple spanner or whatever, you undo that link, you swing it off, and you've now removed all of the bonding and all the other earthing from that main earthing conductor. So you can then do a test of the earthing conductor without all the parallels. Um, just to talk about 
protecting conductors again here in general. We've got the means of earth there. That's the main earthing terminal. So that's the earthing conductor. We have an extraneous conductive part. We have another extraneous conductive part. And so the main protective bonding conductor goes from the main earthing terminal to the extraneous conductive parts. We then have current using equipment here and here. So this conductor is the CPC, circuit protective conductor. And then we have a potential proximity issue with regards to arms reach. Let's remember that we talked about this, that we only really think about supplementary bonding if we are concerned with the potential value of touch voltage that could occur in a fault condition. And we determine that with regards to the fault current that is achieved or the fault current that is required to disconnect the protected device for the circuit in question. So the ZS can be referred to determine the earth fault current and the earth fault current 50 volts over that will determine the value of resistance that you then measure between exposed and extraneous conductive parts. This will all help determine whether or not supplementary bonding is needed. All right. So going to the cross-sectional areas. The cross-sectional area of every protective conductor, other than the protective bonding, so now we're talking about how to determine sizes of earths, not bonds, shall be calculated in the course of 543.1.3, using that, or selected in the course with table uh, with regulation 543.1.4, which uses those. Calculation in course 543.1.3 is necessary if the choice of cross-sectional area of the line conductors has been determined by consideration of short circuit current and if the earth fault current is expected to be less than that short circuit current. If the protective conductor is not an integral part of the cable and is not formed by a conduit and is not contained in an enclosure formed by a wiring system, so in other words it's a single green and yellow running on its own accord, then it will be sized 2.5 mil if it has mechanical damage protection, or 4 mil if not. So that's sizing for mechanical protection there. So those are minimum sizes. And then it says 543.1.2, where a protective conductor is common to two or more circuits, its cross central area shall be calculating the course of 543.1.3 with the most onerous of the values of fault current and operating time encountered in each of the various circuits. So whichever one is the, the whichever of the two circuits requires the larger earth, that will be a common size for the two cables because it will achieve the highest amount of fault current because of its lowered impedance. Or selecting the course with 543.1.4 so as to correspond with the cross-sectional area of the largest line conductor of the circuit. Similar principle. Cross-sectional area where calculated shall be not less than the value determined by the following formula or shall be obtained by reference to BS7454. And that's the adiabatic equation. So S is equal to the square root of I squared T over K. This is simply a calculation to determine the minimum size of the protective conductor. So if I just um, come up with an example. All right. Uh, Trying to think of the ones that we used before. <clears throat> yeah, we did. We did this back in chapter uh, chapter forty one, I think it was. With cable sizes, we had I B I N I Z, and we came up with a ten mil. We came up with a ten mil twin and earth and we had the scenario here of a 10 kilowatt heater TNS system and all that stuff so that's what we had I'm going to cut, cut the video to capture this at the moment. But, so it's S is equal to the square root of I squared T over K. And going from that scenario that we had earlier on, 
we had a I don't know which IM we ended up going with. Let's say that we went with uh, fifth. Just gonna say we went with forty five. The required uh, current for that type what was it? It was a type C. So that's going to be times ten. It's going to be four hundred and fifty amp for instantaneous disconnection. It needs instantaneous disconnection. Zero point one to five. Yeah. So that's it. So it's going to be four hundred and fifty amp. Is I F. Now I can confirm that. If I go to the curves in the back, All right, so I'm going to go to the curves in appendix three for the type C circuit breaker. All right. That's the type C circuit breaker. And they haven't got the 45, but they have the 40 and the 50, and the 40 is 400, the 50 is 500, so 45 amp is 450 amp. That's pretty much how that works. So this is what I've got so far. I've got S square of I squared T over K, uh, and I'm calling IF because it's fault current. That's just how my head works. So that's 450 amp. Okay, the T. Now that amount of current, it tells me in this table will achieve a 0 0.1 to 5 second disconnection. So I can actually call T 0 0.1, you know, because it's going to disconnect 0 0.1. And it tells me, back in 54, that T is the operating time of the protected device corresponding to the fault current. So, right, so the amount of time corresponding to that fault current is 0 0.1 seconds. So T equals... 0.1 seconds okay k is the factor now if we look back on page 197 this was a twin and earth in this scenario that we did it was a twin and earth which is 70 degree thermoplastic cable look at the titles of these tables 54.2 Cables in a, not incorporated in the cable, not bunched with cables. So that's a single cable on its own. We're not that one. 54.3, a cable bunched with cables. That's probably the one that we want. Table 54.4, it's a sheath of an armour. No, that's crap. 54.5 uh, is ducting or trunking. No. So we want table 54.3 because in a twin nerf, the protective conductor is sandwiched between two live conductors under load. So, 70 degree thermoplastic, and we now want copper. We have 115 slash 103 with a star. The star, if you look underneath to the left of it, says above 300 mil. We're not above 300 mil. We're talking here about a 10 mil, and then the corresponding earth for a 10 mil. So, we're going to say K is 115, which is quite often what K is for many circumstances. So, K equals 115. All right, so that's what we have. Okay, and I'm just going to calculate that. I'll rewrite it. So S is equal to the square root of 450 squared times 0 0.1. And it's the square root of the top line. Okay, don't square root the whole sum. And then that's over 115. Like that. Now, while I tie this in, just have a think. What if I, if this is a twin and earth cable? Surely the earth has already already been determined, you know. Um, ten mil. What's the size of an earth in ten mil? Is it four mil, six mil? Depends what you think. Uh, four mil is um, what I have and I use in the book. So what I'm going to say is right. Well, if this cable, if this calculation says I need I need five mil or I need I need, you know, seven mil. Then, I, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in trouble. But I want a number under four when I do this. So four five o oh, squ oh, That's the wrong one. Uh, four five o oh, squared times zero point one equals square root over one one five. Okay. 
it was only a, it was only a very very small amount of um, it, camera camera camera. There we go. One point two three seven. So I'd round that up to a cable size. That's one point five mil. I require one point five mil. Um, as a minimum required protective conductor. All right. So obviously the protective conductor coming with that 10 mil, it's going to be fine. Let's adjust it slightly. Let's say, let's say that the T, let's say the protected, let's pretend the protected device is slightly different. Let's change that protected device to the BS3036. Okay. So, because, yeah, why not? All right, with an MCB, you can see why a lot of circuits kind of get away with design with an MCB because it works. The device's speedy characteristics and everything um, just works very well. I'm going to BS3036. Now, obviously, they don't do a 45, so we'll go with the, the 40 of that. Well, no, it's an IBF 44, so we're going to have to go. Oh, um, I can't remember. 50? Let's have a look. Right, I'm in the I'm in the curves again. I'm looking at right. Oh, they do do a, they do do a forty five. Stone me. Okay. Um, so on page three six six, back in the curves, you'll see there is a forty five amp. Now here's the question though: What is the required disconnection time? This is a this is where we need to combine our our, our journey so far. We we need to now think about what we've done in chapter forty one. This is a TN system. It's a final circuit, but it exceeds thirty two amp. So a final circuit exceeding thirty two amp. It's not a socket outlet circuit. It's a final circuit exceeding thirty two amp on a TN system. Yeah, and that was five seconds. So we require five seconds is our maximum disconnection time. And if we look at 45 amp, it's 145 amps. Okay. Page 366, table or figure 3A2B, 45 amp. Look at the table in the corner. 45 amp, then go along to the five second column. All right. Hopefully, I've not lost any of you with that. So, what we're going to change here, we're going to change the current. To 145 and the time to 5. Alright, that's what I've done there. Change the current to 145 amp and I've changed the time to 5 seconds. I'm just going to put that back in the formula. One four five squared times five over it's still one one five equals so that's the new formula on the bottom there. One four five squared times five hundred forty five amp times five seconds over one one five. Right, one four five oops. So I now get, oh, camera, 2.819. Okay, so it's over 2.5. There's no 3 mil. I have to round it up to 4 mil. So my minimum protective conductor size if my protective device is a 3036 with a maximum disconnection time of 5 seconds, which is the requirements of the regulations, um, changes from a 1.5 to a 4 mil. Okay. It was it was a 10 mil cable, so you, we did, you know, so that's, that's fine. Um, but you can just see how it changes, how changing the protective device can suddenly change the 
adiabatic equation and change the actual circuit's characteristics. Sometimes for the worse, and sometimes for the better. Um, again, in this case, you know, you can see clearly that a type C MCB was a lot more effective. Um, but you may also notice, though, that you did require quite a large amount of current on that circuit breaker. 450 amp, really, was what was required to achieve this connection instantaneously. Whilst only 145 amp was needed to achieve the uh, the 5 seconds for the 3036. That's an example of calculation. Both, I mean, in the, in the case that we did with the 10mm twin and earth, we did this cable calculation in chapter 41, and we got to the conclusion that with the, with the method of installation and all the factors, the rating factors that we used, we set a 10mm, and we verified volt drop. So we're going 10mm good, volt drop good. We still can't actually use that cable type, though, until we've done this bit that we've just done, verifying the protective conductor as well. Because if you think about it, the protective conductor... It's an idle cool cable. It's it's obviously most of the time very dormant. It's not doing much. It's it's surrounded by two larger cables under load, and they're having a little heating effect. And that cable suddenly may, under an earth fault, just be asked to tolerate all this stress, all this um, you know, the mechanical pressure of an earth fault. And quite often it can, if it's too small, it can actually during that t period of time just break um, which is one of the reasons why we're supposed to do pat testing at 25 amp you know um, we're supposed to actually challenge the protective conductor to break with pat testing so that's what we've done there we verify the protective conductor can tolerate the full condition uh, for the period of time that the full condition will be there right well that was calculation the other method was selection so let's look at selection now the alternative we turn the page, so we go to page 198, and it says 543.1.4. Where it's desired not to calculate the minimum cross-sectional area of a protective conductor in accordance with 543.1.3, the cross-sectional area may be determined in accordance with table 54.7. This is an overcompensation table. Um, the calculations that we've just done shows you that you don't need to have a protective conductor the same size. You know, you can have it quite small and you'd achieve sufficient protection. Um, I see a lot of electricians at new installations or existing installations on a TNS system fail because of the sizing of the earth. But if they use the adiabatic and calculate it, it's absolutely fine. So, how are we doing this? Okay. Where the application of table 54.7 produces a non-standard size, a conductor having a larger standard cross-sectional area shall be used. So look at the table. It's sized to the line conductor. So we have the first column, cross-sectional area of the line conductor, known as S. So in this example that we've done, S is 10 mil. That was our S. So this says, if our line conductor, S, is less than or equal to 16 mil, then the minimum cross-sectional area of the corresponding protective conductor, if it's of the same material as the line conductor, which is copper, shall be S. That means if I have a 10 mil, my protective conductor should be 10 mil. So the simple selection procedure here, my twin and earth doesn't work. In fact, if you think about it, twin and earths go up to 16 mil. So any cable that is less than or equal to 16 mil must be the same size as the live conductors. This technically means any time you use a twin and earth with a smaller protective conductor, you should actually be using this method. You should always verify your protective conductors with the adiabatic equation because this method does not work. This table does not work. All right. Now, if my protective conductor was a 25 mil, sorry, my, if my, my line conductor was a 25 mil, then you can see it's 16. If my line conductor is 100 mil, then it's over two, so that's 50. Okay, so we just size it accordingly to that. 
Right, so we, we match it all the way up to 16 mil. And then we're over that, we are 16 mil up to 35 mil. If I have anything over 35, then it's half. Or the next cable up. It's fairly simple. Fairly simple. Um, and in larger installations, we wouldn't use it still because it'd be a waste of money. Um, so, yeah, that's what I think about that. But it doesn't work with twin nerves. Okay, that's that's where you have to where you have to do do that that we've just done. And again, I mean, I'll be more than happy to provide some examples and some work examples and some dedicated streams and content to go over these formulas as much as you need to. But that's sizing of protective conductors. Now we have types of protective conductor. It has a protective conductor consists of one of the following a single core cable, a conductor in a cable, an insulated or bare conductor in a common enclosure with insulated live conductors. Yeah, so like a containment system. And then it says there metal conduits, etc., as well. Um, 543.2.3 .3, a gas pipe, oil pipe, flexible or pliable conduit. Support wire or other flexible metallic parts or constructional parts subject to mechanical stresses in normal use will not be selected as a protective conductor. So, yeah, flexible conduits. If we use those, we must have a dedicated CPC in there. We can't use metal conduits as the protective conductor of the circuit. The protective conductor of the types described in items 1 to 4 above will be 10 mil or less of copper. Uh, that's because if we're going to go with aluminium, we start at 16 mil due to the fact that we need to size it for strength. All right. It's um, fine. Um, five four three dot two dot seven. When the protective conductor is formed by metal conduit, trunking or ducting, or the metal sheath of an armour or cable, the earthen terminal of each accessory shall be connected by a separate protective conductor to an earthen terminal incorporated in the associated box or other enclosure. This is the regulation that answers that question of do you have to earth the back box or not. Um, back boxes have an earth terminal because if you use the wiring system a glanded armoured or a steel, uh, steel conduit, if you're using the wiring system as your main protective conductor route and not a CPC within the system, then you need to find a way to take that wiring system and bring it to the accessory. Yeah, And that's what that is saying. So do we earth the back boxes by default? No. We earth the back box to our socket. We earth the socket off the back box if the wiring system of the conduit has taken the back box as part of the um, wiring system. So we never take an earth from the socket to the back box. If anything, we bring the earth that's arrived at the back box forwards to the socket. 543.2.9. Well, except where the circuit protective conductor is formed by a metal covering or enclosure containing all of the conductors of the ring, the circuit protective conductor of every ring vinyl circuit shall also be run in the form of a ring having both ends connected to the earthen terminal at the origin of the circuit. So it just lets us know about the ring final arrangement. It's interesting because the ring final circuit is mainly a UK regulation, but that regulation isn't UK specific. So I'm going to do a bit of reading into that because I'm quite. That should. I'm assuming that that would be UK specific. That one. Okay. Preservation of electrical continuity. Uh, five four three dot three dot two zero one. This is a UK only one. A protective conductor having a cross sectional area up to and including six mil will be protected throughout by covering at least equivalent. So that provided by installation of a single core non sheathed cable of appropriate size having a voltage rating of at least 450 750 volts. So, in other words, if anything is up to and including 6 mil, it can't be bare, it has to be having a green and yellow covering on it. Uh, 
Okay, switching and protected conductors. This is EU regulation 101. We, we can go past that. Typical continuous. Concentric cables. All right, I want to go to 543.7. Earthly requirements for installations having equipment with high protective conductor current. So dot 201, dot 202, and dot 203. These are all UK specific. So dot 201, equipment having a protective conductor current exceeding 3.5 milliamps but not exceeding 10 milliamps. This is a piece of equipment that's between 3.5 to 10. Shall be either permanently connected to the fixed wiring of the installation without the use of a plug and socket outlet or connected by means of a plug and socket outlet complying with BSCN 60309-2. BSCN 60309-2 is probably what you would consider the old... Um, the C form or the commando type. The difference being that when I look at um, a 136, one kind of plug and socket, and I and I go to unplug it, I can potentially, in the insertion and, and removal, touch an exposed part. I can reach the conductive pin, and if there's any current flowing through to that protective conductor, and I'm touching a protective conductor, I can experience some sensation through that. However, if it's the 60309, that's obviously inside the hollow of the of the socket, and I can't, in the action of removal, make contact with that. Dot two hundred two. Equipment having a protective conductor that exceeds ten milliamps. This is more. Will be permanently wired to the fixed installation. A ca uh, have a flexible cable and plug to 60309-2 again, in which case the cross-sectional area will be 2.5 mil for plugs at 16 amp and no less than 4 mil for plugs above 16 amp. And the protective conductor will be sized the same as the line conductor, which in a flex it will be anyway. Or three, you have an earth monitoring system. Okay, so those are lot, uh, stricter requirements. And dot 203, the wiring of every final circuit and distribution circuit intended to supply one or more items of equipment such that the total protective conductor current is likely to exceed 10 milliamp will have what we call high integrity protective connection in complying with the following. So we'll have a single protective conductor of 10 mil, large mechanical strength there, or a single copper protective conductor having a cross sectional area of not less than 4 mil complying with the requirements of 543.2 and 543.3. Or two individual protective conductors to the class of five or three, which could be of different types. So you can have, for example, a conduit system with acting as a return and a single um, cable in there acting as the route all the way through. So you run the green and yellow cable through, and then when you get to the end, the conduit system returns it. Yes, yeah, so it's like it's like a loop. When the two individual protective conductors are, to, uh, are both incorporated in a single multi-core cable, the total cross-sectional area will be equivalent to 10 mil. Or you have an earth monitoring system again, or you have a double wound transformer. 543.7.1.204, where two protective conductors are used in accordance with 543.7.1.203.3, the ends of the protective conductors shall be terminated independently of each other at all the connection points throughout the circuit. So the scenario I just explained, where we keep it as a ring, what we want to do is make sure that those protective conductors don't connect into the same terminal. This is why when you actually look at a socket outlet circuit, and you look at socket outlets, and you look behind them, you'll notice that there are two protective conductor terminals, two earth terminals. The reason they make those is circuits with high integrity earthing over 10 milliamp will require the protective conductor to be installed in the terminal separately and not in the same terminal. They must be separate. So if one was to come out, the other one was to remain effective. We do need to understand that that goes all the way to the fuse board as well. So in the case of a circuit of high integrity earthing, we'd have to have the protective conductors in two terminals. Now if you remember in, in uh, section 514, there was a label for this purpose. There was a label that warned electricians that circuits 7 and 9 or 7 and 8 or whatever are both circuits of high integrity earthing and maybe they are sharing the protective conductors or maybe this is the, this terminal does the protective conductors of two and this protective uh, terminal does the other two. 
but they must be separate for the circuit concerned. Okay. Socket out of the final circuit, same principle. Okay, so we connect it as a ring. Uh, ring final circuit with a ring protected conductor spurs, if provided, require high integrity protective conductor. Comply with 543.7.1 as we've just gone through. A radial final circuit with a single protective conductor would then have the protective conductor being connected as a ring. So you'd have your radial circuit, then when you get to the end, you take an earth and you come back. So it's a ring for the earth alone. A separate protective conductor being provided at the final socket outlet by a connection to a metal conduit or ducting. Similar principle. So you take the, the radial protective conductor to the final point, where it then makes contact with a conduit route, which is probably the wiring system for that circuit, to come back. You've created a ring. This other one's quite interesting. Where two or more similar radial circuits supply socket outlets in adjacent areas and are fed from the same distribution position, they have identical means of short circuit current and over current protection and circuit protective conductors of the same size, then the sec second protective conductor may be provided at the final socket outlet on one circuit by connection to the protective conductor of the adjacent circuit. So picture this. Imagine you've got a school computer room and you've got a board that goes to one load of dado trunking on one side and another on the other, on the other side. They're both, I don't know, let's say they're 25 amp 61009s feeding 10 sockets, but the cumulative value of protective conductor current was to go high. When you get to the end, you can link the protective conductors together so that whilst you have two radials, technically you'd have continuity at the board between the CPC of one circuit and the CPC of the other. Now, this would, would, if this was unlabeled, this would confuse the hell out of an electrician. Because uh, he'd have open circuit on line and line and open circuit on neutral because they're in two separate breakers, but they'd have continuity between the CPCs. So there must be labeling and warning of that for him. Okay, so that talks about the earthing. Let's talk about bonding briefly. 544. Very simple. Question is, is it a PME or not? If it's a PME, we go to the table. If it's not, we go to this regulation 544.1.1. So, TNT systems, TNS systems, except where PME conditions apply, a main protected bonding conductor shall have a cross-sectional area not less than half the cross-sectional area of the earthy conductor of the installation and not less than 6 mil. The cross-sectional area need not exceed 25 mil if the bonding conductor is of copper or cross-sectional area affording equivalent conductance in other metals. So, 6 mil or half of the earth. So if my supply main earthing terminal, my main earthing conductor on my TNS system is 10 mil, half of that is five, no, I'll go six, six is my minimum. If it's 16 mil, well, half of that is eight, the six minimum is lower, so I'd have to go from eight up to 10. I would go up to 10. Now, if I've got a 25 mil, well, after that, okay, 12 and a half, and I'll go up to 16 mil. So you halve it, and then you go up to the next one. Quite simple. We size it to the supply, uh, to the main earthing conductor. With PME, however, the main earthing conductor is connected to the neutral, so we size it to the neutral. So, minimum cross sectional area of the main protected bonding conductor in relation to the pen conductor of the supply. In this case, I don't know, my TNCS system has a 25 mil cable. Okay, 35 mil or less is 10 mil. So you can see with this method, when we use PME, TNCS, we don't go any smaller than 10 mil. Whilst with TNSs and TTs, we can go as small as 6 mil. So a lot of people go, oh, this yeah, bonding's 10, bonding's 10, bonding's 10. It depends on the earthing system. All right. So you can't just say, oh, that earth needs to be 10 mil if it's 6 mil. If it's a TNS or a TT, it's fine. 544.1.2 The main protective bonding connection to any extraneous conductive parts such as gas, water or other metallic pipework or service should be made as near as practicable to the point of entry of that part into the premises. That's key. I see a lot of local authorities and councils and other places with all the homes that they have and they'll have these gas meters in little utility cupboards outside adjacent to the front door and I'll see some green and yellow cable out there clipping into this unit or a conduit coming through the wall 
and they're exporting their potential zone. They're taking it outside of the premises, which is just crap. You shouldn't do that. You should not export your echo potential zone. That's the whole point of it, having, of having an echo potential zone. So it says there, first thing it says is at point of entry to the premises or the most accessible part after entry to the premises. Where there is a meter, isolation point or union, the connection shall be made to the consumer's hard metal pipe work and before any branch pipe work. Where practicable, where practicable, this shall be made within 600 mil of the meter outlet union or any point of entry to the building if the meter is external. Couldn't be simpler. If the meter is external, you bond it at the point of entry to the building. Don't take your bond outside. Supplementary bonding to finish. This is just sizing of supplementary bonding. This isn't the question on do we need it or not. That was determined back in chapter 41 when we used Ohm's law. 50 volts over the fault current determined the value of resistance. This is what size would we need if we need it. So, remember that supplementary bonding is to connect exposed to exposed, trunking to exposed metal switch thing, extraneous to extraneous, water pipe to gas pipe, and exposed to extraneous, so switch gear to gas pipe. Okay, so three circumstances here, three scenarios. The first one, 544.2.1, a supplementary bonding conductor connecting two exposed conductive parts. Yeah. Shall have a conductance if sheathed or otherwise will provide with mechanical protection. So if they are mechanically protected, so there's no need to consider increasing size for that. Not less than that of the smaller protective conductor here. So the small, you know, the protective conductor in here and the protective conductors in here. Whichever one is the smallest, and I have mechanical protection for this, fine. If I don't have mechanical protection for this, as illustrated here, four mil. Okay, four mil. The next one, a submetric bonding conductor connecting an exposed conductive part to an extraneous conductive part shall again, if sheath or otherwise mechanically protected, etc., be not less than half that of the protective conductor connected to the exposed conductive part. If mechanical protection is not achieved, as it isn't here, 4 mil. So 4 mil and 4 mil. Okay. The last one. A supplementary bonding conductor that connects this extraneous to an extraneous. Now, this is slightly different. There is no exposed conductive part, so there is no CPC here. There is no existing circuit protective conductor. It's a gas and a water pipe. So what does it say? Well, if we do achieve this mechanical strength sheathing protection, we can go as small as 2.5 mil. In the absence of that, though, guess what? It's also 4 mil. So you can forgive and forget why spark is just go, well, oh, supplementary bonding's four mil. It's just easier and saves all the faff. Okay. But if you were to say, oh, you know, you have a switch isolator here with a 10 mil cable and you do have mechanical and sheathing protection to the supplementary bonding, what size should it be minimum? You'd actually say, oh, okay, can't be four mil because it's got protection. That's a 10 mil. It says half of that at least. Half of that is five. No, it goes up to six. You'd say, you'd say, half of that is six mil. But I'll just use four because that's okay. It's just easier. So again, it still is easier to use four. Uh, the last little bit there, 544.2.5, just tells you if supplementary bonding is to be applied to a fixed appliance which is supplied via a short flex outlet from an adjacent connection. So you've got like a flex outlet point and then you've got a flex to to like a, a, a radiator or something or a towel rail in a bathroom. Then that little green and yellow cord set, that green and yellow in that cord set there will achieve supplementary bonding as you can see, because it's got sheathing protection, it's got mechanical protection. And as these have just been saying, we don't need to size it that much compared to that. So we just use it in this case. So don't don't forget that because again I see a lot I've seen that a lot in the past where you have a little flex outlet, you've got a little flex coming out going to a tower out, and then you've got a green and yellow going 
going with it, which is just, you know, crap. All right. So to conclude chapter 54, we've talked about the Earthing Arrangements, TNS, TNCS, TT Systems. We've talked about types of electrodes, plates, wires, tapes, and burying earthing conductors. Table 54.1. Burying earthing conductors. Familiarize yourself with that table. We've then talked about sizing, and we said, okay, well, we had the scenario that we did the previous time in Chapter 41's cable calculation, which gave us a 10 mil. We knew that it was a TN system, TNS, and we knew the requirements of the circuit. So we decided to use the adiabatic and calculate two two scenarios with two different protected devices. Uh, and we we figured out that the 10 mil was fine because it was a 1.5 mil or a 4 mil. We also noticed though that when we tried the selection method using the tables in the regulations, it doesn't like uh, twin earth at all. We then looked at the protective conductor currents and the mishmash with those, and then we looked at the bonding at the end, selection of the bonding being determined by the earthing system, whether it be a PME or not. If it's a PME, we size it to the neutral within the conductor. If it's not, we size it to the size of the main earthing conductor. Okay. Run through those scenarios a few times. Familiarize yourself with them. Um, this is all about sizing, selecting of earthing and bonding. The next one, chapter 55, is other equipment, which is going to be a bit of a mix-up of small stuff, really. What fun. Ah, oh, see you there.